why did the universe move in this direction, right? So yeah. we have a, a universe that's 14 some billion years old. Why has it progressed in a certain direction? And why do we have planet Earth with rational, intelligent life on it now? Is there sort of a direction there? Is there a pattern? Um, and we can look at the, you know, at all different levels, the level of physics, chemistry, yeah. biology, neurobiology, and then philosophy, you yeah. know, in, in terms of uh, what does it mean to flourish as a human person in this particular universe, right? right. You know, we find ourselves, this is the universe we find ourselves in. So, you know, what does it all mean, right? Hello and welcome to The Purposeful Lab, episode one, a podcast brought to you by the Magis Center. I'm Katherine Hadro, and I am so grateful to be joined by my co-host, Dr. Dan Keebler. Dr. Keebler, here we are. Finally, episode one, how are you feeling? I'm ready to go. I'm <laughs> yes. excited to launch this project and, and launch this podcast, and, um, and I'm delighted to be sharing the microphone with you. Well, I, I first want to introduce you to our viewers and to our listeners. Um, I've had the privilege of getting to know you for really since the end of 2022, um, since I started doing some work with the Purposeful Universe, which we'll get into your co-project lead for the Purposeful Universe. Um, and you've been um, such a such a gift to get to know. So I'm just going to read through some of some of your credentials, if if you don't mind, and I hope this doesn't embarrass you too much, yeah. but you've worked as a biology professor at Franciscan University of Steubenville since 2001. That's right. Yeah. If that's right. You have received a doctorate in molecular biology from the University of Berkeley. Um, you're involved in clinical research, product development, and consulting projects with a variety of biotechnology firms in the regenerative, regenerative medicine field say that three times yeah. fast. Um, you're also an experienced speaker and author, uh, particularly from a Catholic perspective. Obviously, you, you teach at a Catholic university, and you've written the book, The Evolution Controversy, A Survey of Competing Theories. That's right. Yeah. So I have uh, you know, been teaching for 20-some years now to undergraduates at, at Franciscan University in a wide variety of classes um, uh, there because kind of small undergraduate university you can't specialize as much as you can at a big university um, but uh, that that's that's great because I'm interested in a lot of different areas of biology and uh, uh, you know I've been interested particularly in evolution for for, for many years and also cell biology and uh, and, and so uh, done done research in, in in both of those areas and um, I've been a Project co lead on this purposeful universe yeah. project, which is uh, you know very uh, much an integrative thing, not looking just at biology, but looking at science and you know psychology and all kinds of different areas, which has been just a, a, a pleasure to to be part of. So. You've been a science professor, you know, since two thousand one. Have you always been interested? In science, did you always know you were going to grow up and be a scientist? No, I did not. Really? Yeah, yeah, I was shocked. Yeah, when I went to college, I had no idea what I was going to do. So I, uh, I think people can relate I, to that. Yeah, exactly. So you know, I see a lot of uh, students coming into college in the same same boat I was in. You know, I was uh, I switched majors four times in my first four years of um, uh, my first two years of, of, of undergraduate. And, uh, you know, I was like, I got to graduate somehow. What, what am I going to do? And I ended up uh, be, being an English major uh, uh, as an undergraduate. So, uh, but I also took a bunch of science classes because I was interested in science. And, uh, you know, I was thinking of going to med school. Um, and, um, uh, you know, what really changed my life was one of the professors um, invited me to come work in his lab as a, when I was a senior. Um, and I fell in love with working in the lab. And I said, this is, this is something that uh, I'm good at, I enjoy. Um, I, I'm going to make a terrible doctor if I go in that direction. <laughs> um, and he invited me to apply for uh, a master's program. This was at Catholic University in Washington, D.C. Um, and so I did my master's there and then um, you know, went on for my Ph.D. at, at, at Cal Berkeley. So wow. um, that's, that's how I fell into science. It was, it was really uh, sort of serendipitous. It wasn't something that I, I planned. It, you know, it was a human connection where someone yeah. said, hey, why don't you come work in my lab? They saw something in me. And, uh, and, and I really uh, you know, became a lab rat at that point. <laughs> but the power of an invitation and the yeah. impact that that had in your life. And you use both sides of the brain then if you studied English as well. So Yeah, yeah it's very helpful for, for writing in, in science. You know, one of the things uh, I think a lot of scientists, uh, 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 you know, I, I still struggle with writing, but but it's it's often the difficulty writing your, your thesis and your manuscript and just having that English background is really, really helpful. That 
that's awesome. No, I and something that I love, and we're going to get in this whole episode, we're going to be introducing the concept of the Purposeful Lab. We'll be walking through and kind of previewing what this season is about and why we're doing this. Um, but I have a very different background. My background yeah. is in broadcast, specifically Catholic media for the past decade. Um, so I think, and again, we'll be talking through this, but the fact that here we have with this podcast, it's a scientist and a journalist coming together. And yeah. I think something you and I share, I am by no means a scientist, you know, this... But one thing that I think we share in common is we both have this heart for discovering truth and searching for it, you know, whether it's in a laboratory or whether it's in interviews. That's really my heart and passion is I love sitting down and, and speaking with people and learning and, and sharing that with others, really making information accessible for others. So yeah. I mentioned that you're the project co-lead of the Purposeful Universe, uh, which provides science-driven videos and web content focused on the abundant order in nature. That that is its goal, that is its its mission from cosmology to biological evolution to to consciousness. Is there more that you want to say there? The, the purposeful universe, the 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 whole uh, point or purpose of it, you know, is to um, I think it, it's sort of twofold. One is to combat this notion that the more you look in the uh, at the science uh, the more uh, further or um, alienated you become from purpose, right? Uh, the idea that, uh, you know, oh, if you look at the uh, universe, it's mostly cold, dark space, it's huge, it's vast, and we're just some small little um, evolutionary right. backwater here in some weird arm of the Milky Way, um, that there's nothing, um, no purpose, no uh, direction, no underlying meaning to it all, mm -hmm. right? Um, and um, a lot of people read that from the science. They say, look, well, that's what the science shows. Um, and uh, part of the goal of the Purposeful Universe is to show and exhibit, no, there's, there's an order and there's mm -hmm. a pattern here. Um, and that suggests something more, right? That, that, that the, the science doesn't demonstrate there's no purpose to, 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 to life. And I think for people that are, you know, um, searching for purpose and meaning in their mm -hmm. life, if they think that the universe is just cold and indifferent um, and so forth, I think right. uh, uh, because we are part of the universe, mm -hmm. we're physical beings, we're part of the universe, that uh, it, it makes it more difficult for them to find purpose and meaning in their lives. But when you look at the universe and see this underlying order at every level um, and the, the sort of the complexity there um, and uh, the the order and sort of direction of uh, the universe that you see from you know cosmology all the mm -hmm. way up to uh, human behavior I I think it changes your perspective on you know um, the meaning of the universe it, it, and it again science isn't going to tell you the purpose of the universe i can't go into the lab and you know mix stuff together and figure out what the purpose of my life is the purpose of 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 the universe but i i think science reveals as we talked about you know mm -hmm. we're searching for truth it reveals certain truths that help us to sort of integrate that into what does it mean to be human and what does it mean to flourish as a human being right our biology our chemistry that that has a role in answering that that, mm -hmm. that question. Um, and so I think the goal of the Purposeful Universe Project was to mm -hmm. try to shed light on the science um, in a way that does um, sort of justice to this underlying order. I feel like, you know, it's really responding to a need in our culture and in our worlds right now. And if I, if I understand it correctly, Purposeful Universe was launched in 2020. Uh, if that if that's yeah. correct, and it, it, the project of the Purposeful Universe, it's possible because the Maja Center received a John Templeton Foundation grant. And so, for those who aren't familiar with the John Templeton Foundation, its founder. John Templeton, obviously, he wanted to support progress in knowledge, especially at the intersection of religion and science. And so we are so grateful for that support so that the purposeful universe is possible to respond to these big questions that people are asking and that this podcast is possible because of that. But that intersection of faith and science, that really is uh, kind of your, your magic spot, isn't it? Yeah, I, I really, um, you know, uh, enjoy those questions. That's one of the things, you know, I sort of talked about how I stumbled into science. Right. Uh, but um, I think, uh, you know, the, the, those big questions, those metaphysical questions about, you know, what is the meaning of, of life? What's the purpose of, of the, the universe? Why is the universe structured in this way? Why are, why are humans structured in the way that we are? Why do we behave in the way that we do? 
why are, are, are organisms structured the way they are, right? Um, and there's a lot that the science, the chemistry, the biology can reveal. And you know, I fell in love with biochemistry um, and cell biology because you, you know, there's the, the, you can look and see how molecules interact and what that does and how that causes cells to change their structure and behavior. And it's very, very interesting. Um, to, to, to see how it all works. Yeah. But at the end of the day, there's uh, the, the, the underlying question of is, is why is there this, this, this uh, ability, why is the ability mm -hmm. of us as humans to perceive the order that's out there and, and understand that um, and make sense of it? And, and, and why is the universe ordered? Uh, why isn't it just you know, chaotic where you know, uh, science wouldn't even work, right? For science to work, for me to be able to go into the lab and, and, and get some knowledge, there has to be um, some underlying order there for me to discover. It can't just yeah. be just happenstance, so I'll never be able to figure anything out. So, um, and, and it's those bigger questions that really um, have gotten me, me um, uh, you know, it, it, it piqued my interest. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I've written and, and talked a lot about those over the last 10 years, in particular, of, 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 of my career. And I think it, it's helpful, I think, to having a humanities background, having an English background. Right. Um, you know, I uh, always uh, take just just having some, you know, I took a few philosophy classes uh, when I was an mm. undergraduate. I think that helped me out a lot because I think a lot of uh, scientists never have to take a philosophy class. One of the problems with modern education, you go through all of high school, college, and never take a uh, a philosophy class and sort of learn, you know, you know, the, the, how to think properly. Um, uh, we can scientifically reason, but um, there's more to reason than just scientific reason. Yeah. Which, you know, again, with this podcast, with the Purposeful Lab, we're we're going to have a both and approach where we're going to be speaking with scientists on the regular, but also philosophers and kind of looking at both ends and looking at examining this question of purpose when it comes to, yes, the cosmos and the sciences, but also how it relates to each and every single one of us. So I want to talk more about the Purposeful Lab and what the format of our podcasts are going to look like. Obviously, it's taking a unique format for yeah. episode one as we're introducing ourselves and introducing these concepts. But just like the Purposeful Universe, which we've been talking about, addresses cosmology, biological evolution, consciousness, and the purpose of life, we're going to do the same thing right here at the Purposeful Lab. Uh, season one really is going to be... Um, giving an overview of these topics and um, really looking and examining purpose and abundant order and all of these, you know, all these different things. Um, and then we'll, in subsequent seasons, be able to go into more depth in each one of those areas. Yeah, I think what we, you know, we want to, to give a so, so it's the arc of sort of uh, the from the very mind, uh, small um, all the way up to the, the very large, right? And to see an arc of the history of our universe, right? From the very beginning to humans, right? The emergence of humans and see at different stages where, um, you know, why did the universe move in this direction, right? So yeah. we have a, a universe that's 14 some billion years old. Why, why are, has it progressed in uh, a certain direction? Um, and, and why do we have uh, the planet Earth with, uh, you know, um, rational intelligent life on it now? Is yeah. there sort of a direction there? Is there a pattern? Um, and we can look at the, you know, at all different levels, the level of physics, chemistry, yeah. biology, neurobiology, and then philosoph philosophy, you yeah. know, in, in terms of uh, what does it mean to, to flourish as a human person in this particular universe, right? right. And we find ourselves, this is the universe we find ourselves in. So, you know, what does it all mean, right? And that's the, the underlying question Big that questions. humans uh, have asked themselves from, from time immemorial. Um, and one of the things that we, we want to make point, the science isn't going to be able to answer that question, hmm. but it does situate us in the, you know, a, a particular universe and science poses these bigger questions, right? So if you find order in the universe, that poses the question, why do we find this order? Why is the universe structured mm -hmm. in this way? Why do we find ourselves in a universe that can be described uh, mathematically, right? Why uh, do we uh, find ourselves um, in uh, a, a universe that um, is capable of sustaining intelligent life, mm -hmm. right? Why is that the universe that, 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 that is here? Right. And, I, you know, again, episode one, here we are, we're giving a, an overview and digging in a bit into purpose and abundant order. And then episode two, I'm excited about we'll be looking at cosmology and be joined by Dr. Karen Ober. Can you speak about you? You know her in her personal capacity. 
Yeah, yes, you know, so I've um, been to a number of meetings where we both spoken at, um, and and she's. Uh, an excellent research uh, program um, at Harvard where she is uh, looking at um, sort of the process by which planets form um, and particularly exoplanets, planets that might be hospitable um, to uh, mm -hmm. life, right? Um, and how life um, sustaining planets might get there. Um, their, their, their beginnings, right? So, and, and she's looking at the, the order of, you know, from the Big Bang through, you know, wow. the development of stars and solar systems and, um, and, and, and how, how, how do you develop those things from sort of, in a sense, the chaos of the Big Bang? Why, why is right. it moved from that where you've got a bunch of uh, sort of subatomic particles banging around until you start to crystallize these uh, solar systems and, and planets revolving around stars that might be able to um, sustain life. And so that's something that, that, that we'll talk to her about, and particularly also uh, the possibility of life on other planets, things like that, some oh, interesting I, questions. I can't wait to hear what she has yeah. to say on that. And, yeah. and then episode three on biological evolution, which really is a specialty of yours. And again, big time scientist, Dr. Simon Conway Morris. Right, and, and uh, you know, he's, uh, uh, you know, a leading figure, a leading uh, evolutionary biologist. Uh, you know, he's one of the uh, leaders in terms of, uh, of, of paleontology um, and uh, looking at the, the Burgess Shale, uh, which was a series of, of fossils that are from the Cambrian period where uh, you have this rapid, uh, uh, relatively geologically fast emergence of all these different animals that show up in the fossil record. Um, and he's also um, written a lot on what's called uh, evolutionary convergence and looking okay. at how sort of the, there's certain patterns in evolution, right? A lot of people perceive evolution as just random uh, and chance and they say, well, okay, because of that, there's no purpose in, 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 in the world, right? Uh, there's philosophical issues with that argument just because there's chance and randomness doesn't mean there isn't, uh, isn't purpose. But I also think there's a biological issue there that it's more than just chance and randomness. And this is something Simon Conway Morris talks about. This underlying order sort of directs evolution and that there's certain things that are going to work that are going to appear over and over again. And so it would be interesting to talk to him about that. No, absolutely. So we're going from the cosmos, which is like the biggest picture you can get mm -hmm. cosmos, to evolution, to then, you know, rationality and our, our rational brain as well. And we'll be, you'll be speaking with Dr. Um, Stephen Barr. Yeah, Dr. Uh, Stephen Barr is a, a good good friend of mine. He's the president of the Society of Catholic Scientists, um, uh, and he's a physicist. But he's written on a lot of different areas of of, uh, of uh, um, science. And one of the things that he's looked at is uh, uh, he's interested in is the emergence of language and rationality mm -hmm. in, in humans. And how do you explain that? What is what makes humans different? You know, from other uh, from other animals, right? That yeah. that don't have podcasts, right? <laughs> um, Non-podcast animals, right? Um, and so he um, is going to be, you know, on, on our fourth episode, looking at the emergence of human rationality, human consciousness. Yeah. There's something there um, that goes beyond, you know, the material world, right? Is there mm -hmm. something um, that uh, can't be explained by the normal process of science? Um, and uh, so it'll be interesting to hear from him. Absolutely. And then from there, we'll be looking at how we can learn from nature about what nature really reveals to us about the order, abundant order in, in each and every single one of us. And Dr. John Cutteback of Christendom College, who is a philosophy professor, he'll be speaking to that. And so again, I think it's important for our listeners and viewers to know, yes, we'll be speaking with top scientists from literally around the globe, but also from other experts as well when it comes to ac academia and philosophy and, and what have you, and really looking at how um, the purpose when it comes to human flourishing and the impact there as well, because our last episode will be speaking with Father Spitzer, who people may be very familiar with, obviously, from the Maja Center as well. So uh, a, a broad spectrum in season one, again, as as we're looking at purpose and abundant order in all of these different areas of life and of the universe. Yeah, and I think it's important, you know, that, that we see that, that it isn't just a, you know, a, a scientific podcast, exactly. right? It's not just, we're, um, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at sort of these bigger questions and science has something to offer to those, yeah. but science can't answer those questions, right? Yeah. So there's a lot of people that say, wow, well, you know, the universe is purposeless. It, the universe has no goal, no direction. Humans don't. 
that's not a scientific claim, right? Hmm. You know, uh, that, that's a philosophical claim. And that's one of the things that we'll discuss and we'll distinguish. What, what can science, what are the limits of what science can tell you, right? Yeah. Um, and, and what are things that science uh, is going to be able to tell you or what is it going to suggest, right? Um, and that's where thinking about things philosophically, right, um, often you know, you get a bad name in science when you start asking metaphysical questions. And, uh, we don't want to talk <laughs> about that. But those are real questions, and they have real answers, right? Yeah. So, you know, there either is a purpose to the universe or there isn't. That's a factual question. It's either a yes or a no, right? That, uh, but it's not a scientific question, hmm. right? So that's, uh, you know, um, that, that's the type of thing. There, there's a purpose to your life or there isn't, Catherine. It's either a yes or a no. It's wow. one or the other, right? That's a factual question, but it's not something science is going to be able to yeah. determine. But the mm -hmm. science does, I think, um, uh, suggest certain things. We'll be delving in more deeply into each of those different subject areas in the subsequent seasons. But I'd love to just episode one kind of further flesh out this topic of abundant order and, you know, and ask you when it comes to the various scientific circles out there and in, based on conversations that you've had with other scientists as well, do most people view our universe and evolution as random or, you know, what's kind of the leading theory there? Yeah, I think, um, you know, most the popular perception out there, I think, is, is that people think that evolution is chancy and random, huh. you know, um, and that leads people to have a difficult time often integrating evolution with any type of purpose. Well, if it's right. just chance, then we're just a chance occurrence and mm -hmm. there, we, there's no reason for us to be here other than whatever reason we give to to our, our being here yeah. which you know usually doesn't work in terms of uh, helping us live good flourishing lives but um you know in the scientific community i think um you know there is um an aversion not necessarily to to purpose or, but an aversion to talking about that right so modern mm -hmm. science right you know is um you know, has, has, has circumscribed certain questions that it wants to address. And it does a really good job addressing those questions. And it tends to leave other questions alone, right? Um, mm -hmm. And so uh, you know, what is the purpose of evolution, right? What is the purpose of the universe? Or what is the purpose of cosmic evolution? Mm -hmm. Those are natural questions. But those, are, again, are not questions that science can can answer right. right that doesn't mean scientists don't try to answer those i'm a scientist i try to answer that question right. i'm interested in that question because i'm a person right and and people are just interested in in questions of meaning and purpose yeah. if you look at the evolutionary process as it's played out on our our planet you know a lot there are certainly a lot of chance events that go on a lot mm -hmm. of chanciness you know certain mutations occur that drive evolution in one direction or environmental changes mm -hmm. that drive evolution in a different direction but underlying that is a deep amount of order, right? And so mm -hmm. what I often you know, ask students at the beginning, I teach an evolutionary biology class, and I ask them, why does evolution work? And a lot of them never thought about that question. Why does evolution work at all? Why does the right. evolutionary process work? And, it re, the, you know, and, and then we unpack that. And one of the reasons evolution can work is because there's all this underlying order in the chemistry and physics. Without that underlying order, you can't have organisms, you can't have things that can evolve, right? Um, and then when they start to see that underlying order, you can also see how that underlying order directs evolution or drives evolution in certain directions, right? Um, and, uh, you know, one of the great examples of that is sort of proteins where mm. um, the underlying chemistry sort of limits the amount of proteins that are able to, to form. The folds, the three-dimensional mm -hmm. structures of proteins are um, limited by the underlying chemistry. So the chemistry dictates what proteins can evolve. And proteins, you know, you and I are made of a good deal of proteins. They're the, the, the key for doing reactions in your cells. But the, 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 the structures that proteins can take are very limited mm. by the chemistry. It's not just sort of a random free-for-all. Uh, the, the underlying chemistry dictates that they fold in only certain limited ways. So right. it's looking at these bigger questions, mm -hmm. you know, and I think, um, you know, the, I, I find that a very interesting class because I'll have in that class, I'll have some people with science backgrounds and I'll have some people with philosophy backgrounds mm. and theology backgrounds. Um, and it leads to really good conversations. And I'll learn from these people that have theology and philosophy backgrounds, and they can learn wow. from the people that have science backgrounds. But those bigger questions, I think, are um, the, the ones that uh, interest me the most 
because those are the ones I think that, that touch on who I am, who you are, what's the purpose of my life, what's the meaning of my life yeah. um, is, is tied to what's the meaning of the universe, right? <laughs> right? Uh, what's happened in the universe, right? Why right. is the universe structured the way it is? All those questions are, are linked in certain ways. These are big, daunting questions, you know, <laughs> but I think it's helpful and necessary for us to walk through this and think through this and again from different perspectives. So I want to talk through what the format of our podcast typically would be. Typically, it's going to be us introducing a topic and then one of us or both of us interviewing one of these experts that we've discussed. And then at the very end, reacting to that, giving some final thoughts, but there will also be a section um, called the Ask Me Anything, you know, section where I could ask you anything. Um, and again, because you think of so you think of questions from both the scientific perspective and questions that go beyond science, um, I think it'll be really interesting. And we'll make it our listeners and viewers will make it available where they can send in questions as well. And so this will be a great opportunity to react to news headlines, for example, where science is is in the news or people just have a random science question that they want Dr. Keebler to answer. Um, I kind of think of this as office hours, you know, a chance where a student can come and sit down with you um, and get their questions answered. So if that sounds good to you, I'd like to to move on and and throw some questions your way. Yeah, we can can give it a try. (laughs) You know, uh, don't always have the answers in office hours for the students. Well, we'll see. We'll see. So... I mentioned that this will be a good opportunity to us to respond to some news items. And and one piece of news that's been getting quite a bit of attention is it was recently reported that there's a few UK children who have been born from a method that is called mitochondrial replacement theory. I think a lot of people are calling it three-person in vitro fertilization. So basically, the first UK children have now been born using DNA from three different parents. Um, I wanted to throw this your way. Um, as a biologist, what's your reaction to this? And, and do you have concerns? Yeah. So, you know, one of the concerns about this from a scientific perspective is that you, you, we don't know the long-term consequences of this. So what do they do? So, you know, in uh, a woman's oocyte before it's mm. fertilized, right, you have the two types of DNA. You have nuclear DNA, right? We're 46 chromosomes, there's 23 from your mother, 23 from your father that you get. Um, But you also, in the oocyte, have mitochondrial DNA. So Mm. these mitochondria are little organelles um, that make energy for the cell. And the sperm doesn't contribute any, if at all. Um, So you get them from your mother, right? And so if the mitochondrial DNA is damaged in your mother, then your mitochondria are damaged and you can, you know, Mm. you're going to... Uh, inherit that disorder. So the idea is to take another woman's oocyte, right? Um, pull out her DNA, mm. put the um, the mother's the other mother's DNA in there. So now um, you have an oocyte that has the healthy mitochondrial DNA, that other woman's uh, wow. DNA, and then the sperm can fertilize that. Um, the problem is, you know, you're manipulating these these cells. You're, anytime you pull out the DNA. Uh, you're going to pull out other things that might be essential for development um, mm. or, and might affect development in adverse ways that you're not going to see right away. You might mm. show up three, four, five, six years down the road. Um, and, uh, and the other thing is that whenever you pull out you know, the, the DNA from the woman that has the mitochondrial defect, you sometimes pull out some of the mitochondria as well. And so you put some of the damaged mitochondria into the healthy um, uh, egg. It's usually a relatively small percentage, but there's some studies that show that uh, that can increase over time and that can mm. lead to some defects. So it's a it's a, a procedure that we don't really know all the risks there um, yeah. associated with it. And so you're you're putting these children, um, you know, that are, are born at, at, at risk of, of, of having sort of developmental defects later on uh, in life because we, we don't we just don't know. Speaking of DNA, there's um, another DNA article that's in the headlines in the New York Times this time. Um, They recently published an article called Your DNA Can Now Be Pulled from Thin Air. Privacy experts are worried. And so it's all all about these advancements being made in eDNA, which I've never heard of. But this is about trace amounts of genetic material 
um, from all living things that can be left behind. So for example, DNA floating in the air or DNA from your coffee cup, like some of my DNA is on this straw right here. Um, and so obviously this has been helpful for law enforcement in the past when they're solving crimes and, and what have you. Um, but now scientists are raising questions about, well, who can access this, this DNA? Who should be able to analyze it? Wanted to get your thoughts. Um, what what you make of this New York Times headline? Yeah, it's interesting. This eDNA is often referred to as environmental DNA, right? Um, and it's very useful for a lot of research purposes because organisms, you know, we shed cells all the time, you know, it's like, you know, so, yeah. you, you know, and that's got DNA in it, right? Um, and, uh, uh, but uh, you, you can use it for a lot of research purposes, you know, if we want to figure out what organisms are living in a certain soil sample, you can figure out, you know, what, what, what uh, DNA is or in, and uh, they were using it during COVID, I think, uh, to track, you know, if you take a, uh, a sewage sample, you could see, oh, there's this strain of COVID that's there because the environment uh, uh, of, of the sewage would have some of the, the DNA uh, in it. Um, but, um, you know, it, the, it, it, I don't think it, it, currently the technology is that, that worrisome yet because what it really does, um, the, the DNA, um, uh, usually what they do is look to see what species this is, is from. To be able to identify okay. to your DNA, they would have to have some of your DNA. Um, okay. And then they'd have to, because it's messy, they, they, there could be other DNA yeah. uh, on there. And so to be able to distinguish that it's yours is, 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 uh, is difficult, right? But, um, you know, it is, there is uh, well, our technology to be able to amplify really small amounts of DNA is getting better and better. And so when you cough and there's such cells there that, that you cough out, you know, taking that sample and amplifying that DNA, you can, you can you wow. know, sort of see, oh, there's some human DNA there. But you know, in this room, if we've got, you know, a couple people in here, you know, there'll be multiple people's mm -hmm. DNA in, in the air. So that, uh, be able to identify it as yours, um, it can be done, but they would have to know what your DNA is to, to begin with. Well, any just final thoughts as we wrap up episode one? I'm just so excited to get this out there and to launch this and for our listeners and viewers to have this. Any, any final thoughts? Yeah, no, I'm just looking forward to uh, learning from the guests that we're going to be having. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm excited to to be part of this uh, because I think there's a, a need to, to, to have this sort of a more integrated podcast that goes beyond just the science or just beyond like a self-help, you know, exactly. type of thing. But we're, we're trying to integrate a lot of the different things together. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important to note, we didn't mention this yet, is we'll be releasing the podcast in a seasonal format. So we'll have six episodes, season one, you heard us talk about that, but there will be then a break in between. But this is why it's important to hit subscribe on your phone on whatever podcast platform you're using to hit subscribe uh, because that way you'll be alerted when the next episode drops and I think that's the best way to stay in the loop with what's going on and also just want to direct listeners and viewers to go to the Maja Center's website as well. There's so much content to explore there and you can find more information about the podcast and also as we're launching and getting this out there it's a huge help if you give a five-star review if you feel so inclined um, to this podcast that helps to get the word out more as we're launching this out there into the cosmos. <laughs> um, but for now, that does it for the first episode of The Purposeful Lab. I'm Katherine Hadro, joined by Dr. Dan Keebler, and we can't wait to see you next week. <laughs>